I'm going to be in Romans chapter 4, 4 and 5. So if you've got your Bible, uh, you can go to Romans 4. I'm going to start in verse 13. And um, let, me, let me just pray for us. Father, I thank you uh, for what you're doing in our midst. God, I thank you that uh, you're building faith. And my heart today is to build perseverance and to build trust in your story, in your plan, and what you're doing in our individual lives and the greater story of what you're doing on the planet. And so, God, I pray for faith to arise in us today, God. I pray that our hope in you uh, would be sturdy. We would anchor ourselves in you, in the midst of trial, in the midst of persecution, in the midst of struggle, God, I pray that our faith would be strengthened in you. In, in Jesus' name, amen. I want to go after today, uh, I'm going to go after a really specific target today. Uh, I want to go after perseverance. Uh, we, I shared about this with our men's group on Tuesday morning. If you're a man, you ever want to join us on Tuesday morning, I love our Tuesday morning men's group. Uh, we really just get in there and talk about what it means to be a healthy man and healthy masculinity. And this past week, I talked about perseverance. And as I shared about this, it, um, it just moved in my heart to share this morning about perseverance. And I'm going to uh, share a process that's something my wife and I uh, have to walk through um, a really something that really she has to suffer through, and I'm going to talk about that at the end. And my hope is is that it encourages you, that it strengthens you. Um, so, but I want to talk about this persevering. This is uh, you know probably <clears throat> um, well. Let me read this, and then then I'll I'll let Paul speak here. So Romans chapter four, starting in verse thirteen. I'm going to read quite a few scriptures, so hang in there with me. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would inherit the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. If those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made empty and the promise is canceled. For the law produces wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. This is why the promise is by faith, so that it may be according to grace, to guarantee it to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are Abraham's faith. He is the father of all in God's sight. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. Talking about Abraham. Listen to this. He believed in God. This is my heart for us today. He believed in God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. I love this next phrase. We're going to come back to this. Against hope, with hope, he believed. That's what his circumstances weren't speaking believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what has been spoken. So will your descendants be. He considered his own body to be ready, already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb without weakening in faith. He did not waver in unbelief. We're going to talk about that because it kind of seems like he did, but I love, I love this. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promises, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because he was fully convinced like, come on, let this be a. He believed, he was fully convinced that God was able to perform it. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. <clears throat> now it was credited to him, was not written for Abraham alone. So listen to this, he's pulling us into this. Now what was, what was credited to him was not written for Abraham alone, thank you Jesus, but also for us, say me. Come on. It was credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised. Jumping over to verse five, uh, chapter 5, a few, few, five more verses. Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Also through him we have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, listen to this. This is, this, is, this is a powerful, powerful decision right here. Powerful choice that Paul is, in, is inviting us into. And not only that, but we also rejoice in our good times. <laughs> we rejoice when it's easy. We rejoice when it's, you know, all that. It says, but we rejoice in our afflictions. Some, a lot of translations say sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings because we know that affliction produces endurance, a lot of translations say perseverance there. 
Endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Come on, Jesus. So good. I, w- I want to talk about uh, a fun topic, a light, fluffy to- topic, suffering. <laughs> I want to talk about perseverance. Uh, perseverance, in one of the, the translations when it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, one of the translations uses long-suffering, that a fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Some translations say patience. Some translations say um, long-suffering. I think some translations say faith, faithfulness. Um, I've got forbearance, patience. Patience of the Passion Translation says patience that endures. Probably my least favorite translation is long-suffering. <laughs> you know, it's not necessarily like an encouraging word, that long-suffering, that just doesn't, doesn't, doesn't you know, feel <laughs> exciting. Um, but that is actually a fruit of being with God, is, is endurance, is patience, is perseverance, is actually long-suffering, is a fruit that was thrown in to one of the, the nine fruits of the Spirit. And I, I want to read, I looked this up on Google, and you know if you read it on Google, it's right. So, so here we go. I'm kidding, but Google's definition, you know, you probably, probably get it from the Webster's, of definition of perseverance is persistence in doing something despite difficulty. Persistence in doing something despite difficulty, and I love this, or delay in achieving success. Persistence in do, doing something despite difficulty and delay in achieving success. I, I want to just talk for a second about delay, what I call delay gratification. Delay in achieving success. You know, I think as I've looked at, you know, studied kind of psychologists and, and the development of kids, one of the, the, the traits that produces maturity in children as they grow up is learning delayed gratification, is learning that Work and, and effort and persistence actually produces good things. You know, we know, and we all know this, we, we can live, I kind of, I grew up in, I feel like kind of this generation that grew up into this is the microwave generation. You know, you can heat a piece of meat up and it'll taste okay, but if you put it in the grill or the oven, we all know it's going to taste better. And that some things, like good things, actually take time and persistence and consistency in doing the right thing, and that actually produces good things. And that it's, it's a delayed gratification. With my, my, my wife, not too long ago, told me about something she was doing with our oldest son, Johnny. She's got this little jar, and she has a line that's, I don't know, maybe a, a third of the way up, up the jar. And every time Johnny does something extra, I call it being a big person. Every time Johnny is a big person and he shares something out of his own choice with wit, and, or Johnny just goes and he, he encourages somebody, or he takes an extra step and maybe just makes up his bed or something like that without us asking him to do it, then we'll take a little ball and we'll put that ball in the jar. And over time, and this takes months for him to get to, to fill up this little jar, but every time he does something extra, where he has good behavior, does something kind, or is, you know, just kind of goes an extra step with something, we'll go and we'll say, hey, Johnny, that, 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 that got you a ball in the jar. And he'll go, he loves it, and he knows what it is, because when, when the ball gets to a certain line, he knows that he gets to go on Amazon and pick a prize. And if you want to get my son's heart, you give him a prize. He just loves presents. And last, he, he just got one. Last time he had a, a, a Lego set, a, I think it was a Lego superhero or a big Nerf gun. And what do y'all think he picked? The Nerf gun. And my wife said that. I was like, absolutely, he got the Nerf gun. But he was so excited about that. And, but <clears throat> I was like, Kate, I love this because it's teaching him perseverance. It's teaching him delayed gratification, that, that good things often take work. They take effort. They take showing up. They take being consistent in doing something good. And the Scriptures even teach this, that whatever you sow, you'll reap. If you sow to the flesh, then you're going to reap things of the flesh. If you sow into things of the Spirit, then you're going to reap things of the Spirit. And some things, it takes doing that. And that perseverance, which is one of the fruit of the spirits. But I I want to actually go a little bit more today into despite difficulty. Um, Personally, this probably past month or two, is, it has felt like uh, a battle for us. My wife and I, who's walking in with the big JoJo, um, has definitely been a challenge, and I'm, I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, but I, I want to 
unpack this for a minute because I think there's a, a there. It seems like a paradox in Scripture here, and and I want to jump back to to Romans chapter four because I love this. I'm going to read this Romans chapter four. It says, "What then can we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, has found? If Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to brag about, but not before God." For what God does, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accredited to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, pay is not considered a gift, but something owed. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him, who declares righteous the ungodly, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. You know, it's really important, and we, we talk a lot about this, and this has been a huge has had a huge impact on my life and my understanding of the Scripture and God and my own identity, is that none of us in this room, whatever our measuring stick is, none of us measured up to God's glory. None of us. It doesn't matter. Like in, And in the context, it, all, it actually says this before this, or I believe it's just after this, it says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. Like we all actually miss the mark. It doesn't matter how we measure ourselves, whether it was success, whether it was, you know, in this context, obeying the law. Like every single one of us, not, none of us were able to achieve righteousness, to achieve being made right in the image of God. And that God revealed, apart from the law, He revealed Christ, through Christ Jesus and faith in Christ Jesus that you and me, this is the gift of righteousness, that when He died on the cross and we believe in Him, What does it say? That we actually, when we have faith in God, we become right, and we have peace with God, and it's not based upon our work, our effort, our struggle, our perseverance, anything. This is a gift that God has given every single one of us, and we just receive this gift. You know, you don't want to work for something that God's trying to give you. You know, you don't want to put effort into something that that God is freely giving to us, and it's so important to in my own life, learning how to receive what God has made available for us. You know, you can't make God love you anymore. Like, He's just wild about you. He loves you so much that He died for you. You know, like, I can't earn God's love. I can't make Him love me more. That's just something I get to receive in my life. I can't earn His righteousness. That's something that I just receive because of what He did on the cross by faith in Him. And it's important to do that. So what does this mean? It means that in Christ, your identity is secure. It means in Christ, your worth, your value is secure. It means that your eternity in Christ is secure. And we, as the body of Christ, we just receive this by faith, and then we learn how to live out of that. And that is like such a blessing. Like That's the gospel of Jesus, that He did this for us on the cross. Can I get an amen? That's just so good. Come on. I think that's so so important, and it almost feels like this kind of paradox in what I'm saying, because Paul does go on to say, rejoice in your afflictions, rejoice in your suffering, because they do produce perseverance, and perseverance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. And so I I want you to know that your identity is secure. I want you to know that in Christ, your value, the love that God has for you, It's not in question. He loves you. Your identity is something that you receive and that we get to learn to live out of. Eternity is secure because we believe in Christ. Like when we believe in Him and we surrender our heart to Him, what does it say? It transfers us from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So I want to talk about, because he brings up Abraham in here. And there's a lot that we can learn from the life of Abraham and I'm just going to read this, some of my notes about the life of Abraham, and, and, and then go from there. You know, the, Genesis chapter 1 through 11, you know, it sets up the basic storyline of the Bible. God has created all things. He makes humans in His image to rule the world and to partner with Him. Humans choose sin and rebel, and the world spins out of control into violence and death, leading us to really a rebellion and the scattering of people in Babylon. So what is God's rescue plan? What's his, how is He going to redeem the world? Because at this point, God begins, He initiates his, his plan to reconcile the world and to redeem the world and to rescue the world. And He calls a man named Abram, who later He changes his name to Abraham. And He calls Abraham at 75 years old. God calls him to go from his land, Canaan, which God says will become his tells him to go to a land that one day will become his. God promises to make Abraham into a great nation, 
to make his name great and to bless him. Why is God doing this? Because in, in Abraham and in Abraham's family, he will bless the world. And God's plan is to rescue and bless his rebellious world through Abraham's family. While the rest of the Old Testament focuses on, that's why the rest of the, you know, the Old Testament focuses on the Israelites, the, fa- the family of God, the family that came from Abraham. And ultimately, it's pointing to, as we know, Jesus Christ. And that's the ultimate uh, reconciliation plan that God has. So Abraham's story, God promises him a family at 75 years old. You know, that's kind of, you're a little old there. <laughs> 75 years old, God comes to you, and he's like, I'm going to bless you. And, and I'm gonna, I want to I wanna give you a child at 75 years old. We all know, we don't have to go into the details here, but the body's probably not functioning quite well probably not functioning in that way, uh, to be able to reproduce. And Sarah and Abraham are old in their age, and God calls them. And there's, you, could, you can only imagine if you're 75 years old, God tells you He's going to bless you, He's going to give you a child, He's going to make a great family out of your name. Like You're, you're going to try to figure this out. And so Abraham, on two different occasions, like he was afraid for his, his own life because other men were attracted to his wife. And he denies being married to Sarah, which creates problems. Uh, Abraham and Sarah, they come up with this great plan of, you know, if God's going to give us a child, like, and and this maybe Jonathan reading into the story a little bit, like I I I actually kind of like Abraham's effort in this. Like I think he he God can work with a moving ship. You know, he can steer a moving ship. And Abraham even makes mistakes along the way. But he and his, his wife, Sarah, come up with this great plan of, well, why don't you just sleep with my maidservant, Hagar, you know, and, and she'll be able to have a baby. And maybe that's how God's going to do this whole thing. He does that. Obviously, that wasn't God's plan. You know, that causes a lot of problems. And, <clears throat> and so it wasn't until Abraham is 100 years old that he actually has Isaac. So at 75, he's 75 years old. And I think at 86, they end up having Ishmael. And then at 100 years old, it's not till 25 years later, does Abraham actually begin to see this promise unfold. And the reality is, is Abraham, he lived until 175, which, you know, <laughs> that's pretty old. Um, Abraham didn't even see the full manifestation of the promise that God had on him until obviously after he passed away. Like, he didn't even experience that. And I just think about sometimes prophetic words that we get in our own lives. And many of the prophetic words that were spoken in the Old Testament didn't happen until generations later. And so there, there's this aspect of God, of us, of just trusting the story of God. And that Abraham did this. Even, even in his, he wasn't perfect there's times where he lied. They obviously try to, with Ishmael, step in and make this work for God. But he still, throughout this whole process, he was trusting the story that God had for his life. And he persevered. Like, I can only imagine, like, I mean, 25 years from you get this word from God, you know, like, we're kind of wanting, the, you know, this to manifest in like one or two weeks. You know, we get the word and we're like, come on, somebody just gave me this prophetic word that I'm called to the ministry. I'm called to the business world. God's going to bless me. He's going to do this, whatever. And it's like, man, it takes years and years and years, a lot of times for those things to manifest in what God's doing. Because I believe that he wants us to be a part of the story. Like he wants us to be a part of it and us to learn how to trust and, and, and trust God and trust the story that he has for our life. And we, we see this in the, life of day, in the life of Abraham, and ultimately it says that he believed God and he trusted God against hope, like against his circumstances were not communicating to him hope. I mean, you think about it, he's 75 years old. I guess Sarah was somewhere around 75 years old as well. Like, they are, they are not facing circumstances. Like, if they're looking at their circumstances to find hope, they can't find hope. <laughs> they are actually having to hope and anchor themselves in God and believe God to fulfill the promises of God. And I think this is so important for us in our journey, in our life, is to anchor ourselves in God. So, perseverance, having this persevering faith and, and being constant, and there's a, an aspect of God and something that God invites us into to where we can persevere. And the beautiful thing is, is that when we do, it actually produces character and it actually leads to a place of hope. And that's what Paul's talking about. I want to I talk just for a second 
and, and my hope is, is that this helps you. It, 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 um, I want to just kind of process how I process something that Kate and I have to navigate in our lives. And, it's, and it is. And it's a, it is, I, would say it's, I would say it's one of these things where you're not only, only glorifying God, not only we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and not only that, but we also rejoice in our affliction. And again, when I read that, that is a, that is a powerful choice. Like that is not being a victim you know, that is not being necessarily a victim of my circumstances, even though sometimes it's, it's easy to fall into that. That is saying, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to trust your story for my life, even in the trial, even in the suffering, even in the persecution. I am still going to anchor myself like Abraham did, and I'm going to believe God, and I'm going to trust you in the middle of the challenge. And so, you know, my, my wife and I, something that, we, that she deals with is um, she has chronic migraines. And at times they can be really severe. And they can be, to, and for some reason over the past month, they've even been more severe. And, man, I can't tell you how many times we've prayed and believed God. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit. And, and we're believing for the miracle. And, and I believe that, that Jesus, he defeated personally, I believe he defeated migraines on the cross. Like, I just think he got the total victory. And that's, that's the heart posture. That's how we, we go after that. That's how we think about that. That's how we believe about that. We let that influence us. But she's been dealing with this since she's 12 years old. And this has been, I think, somewhere around there. Um, and she's been walking through this uh, for a long time. And she has gotten promises from God. She's had and believes that not only, you know, the promises are that she's going to be healed on this side of eternity. And we are holding on to that, believing and trusting God for that. And it's, it's, a, it's a struggle. You know, it's a, there, there's times not only um, is it the suffering and the pain that is, you know, it's hard to watch somebody you love suffer. You know, that's just a hard, that's hard to see that. Um, but it, it, it's that, and it's also the suffering of, you're not able to fully do everything that you feel like God is calling you to. It's hard when you have kids that are coming into your, your bed at night and, and you know, they want to see, they want mommy to be well. You know, and there's many nights where Kate has to be in bed because of, of the migraines, and that's all that she can, you know, and, and, and my wife just has so much capacity and, and so much faith and so much hope, and it's so amazing to watch her perseverance in this struggle. And it's so, I mean, for me, it encourages my heart and my faith. Um, but there's so much that's just, just it is, it's a, it's a struggle. So it's like, how do, we, how do we process that? You know, how do we walk through this with God? And I just want to give you some things that, that we do to anchor ourselves. And my hope is, as, as, as I'm, I'm just, my, <laughs> I'm, I, I know this is true, that we live on a battlefield that we live, and, and I, I guarantee you, every person in this room, there's probably something, there's some challenge, there's some struggle, there's something that you're having to navigate. And my hope is, is that this helps you walk through that. What we do is, and this is, and I admit I'm probably not going to answer every question, um, but my hope is, is that this helps us think and helps us anchor ourselves in who God says He is. Um, first, we anchor ourselves in the goodness of God. We, in, we embrace this truth. And we allow this to influence us. You know, we, where, where do I get this, a lot of this understanding of who God is? It's in the life of Jesus Christ. When I look at the Scriptures and I look at the life of Jesus, I, I, I see it, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Scriptures say that He's the image of the invisible God. And so when I'm think, whenever I think about God, I am, I am looking at it through the lens of Jesus Christ because He's the perfect representation of the Father. And, and so we, we embrace this reality that God is not against us. We embrace this reality that God is good, that God is not against Kate, that God's not against me, but that God loves us and He's for us and that He actually has a hope and a future for our life. And so we are, we are allowing that to influence who we are. The second thing is, is we're, we're allowing what Jesus did on the cross, the victory. We believe, I believe, that Jesus got total victory on the cross. Like I, I, just, I believe he got it over death, over hell. I believe he got it over sin, over sickness. And, and I, we embrace that victory. And so whenever we're going to pray for this, believe God for this, that, that is the heart. We are looking at it 
as best we can from a place of victory and that God wants to heal her body. And that is what we're holding on to. And we're believing God. And we're praying, if you will, from heaven to earth. And we're believing and standing on what Jesus has done on the cross. Here's, here's a big thing for us. And I think, I think when... Um, I loved what, what Paul said about Abraham when he said, against hope, with hope he believed. I work hard, we work hard, to not change my understanding of God based on my circumstances. I'll just say that again. I think that's such a, a powerful thing in this is that I work hard to not change my understanding of God based on my circumstances. You know, I, I love again, Paul says that that um, <clears throat> that Abraham said against hope, with hope he believed. You know, why did he say against hope? Because his circumstances were not hopeful. Like, he was looking at his circumstances, and he's like, man, I'm 75 years old, my wife's 75 years old, like, this ain't happening. And, but he anchored himself in hope in God. And that's where he anchored himself, is that no matter what my circumstances tell me about this situation, I'm going to anchor myself in what God says. And this is what I love about Abraham, is one, it says that he did believe in God, but he also believed that God was able to do what God said he could do. Like he won, he anchored himself, and I think it's really important, especially in a, in a faith culture where we believe God and we're trusting Him, is that our faith, yes, we're, our faith is in the outcome. Like we're believing God. Like there's things that we're going after. Like we're believing God that my wife is going to be healed. We're, we're praying for that. We're trusting God for that. But we're also, alongside that, I'm anchoring myself in my faith in God so that while I'm waiting on the outcome, if you will, my, my faith is not totally shattered because it's not only in the outcome. My faith is also anchored in Christ. It's anchored in who God says that He is. And I find that when I'm allowing myself to do that, I feel a strength from God. And so it's important to not change, because I, I do think it's easy sometimes, and, and I understand, and I think it's even almost kind of like tempting of like, because something hasn't happened I begin to change my understanding of who God is. There's a, I love this in, in Romans. I'll read this, and I think it does apply. It's, it's a little different context, and I'll explain that. But in Romans 3.3, 3, if you go read this, uh, some of the Israelites were not faithful to the promises of God. And, and he makes a statement here. He says, What then, if some did not believe, will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? <clears throat> So will their unbelief cancel God's faithfulness? And he says, Paul says, absolutely not. Listen to this. God must be true, but everyone else a liar. Yeah, it's kind of strong, strong statement there from Paul here. It's like that everyone else should be a liar and let God be true. But he's, he's making a point here that just because somebody else was unfaithful, that, does not, that is not a reflection of who God is even though it could feel that way. And I think there's a lot of different ways that you could, you could I mean, obviously there's context to what that is, but I think that, that, that principle is true, is that I want God to tell me who He is. I want God, ultimately. I want His Word. I want Jesus. I want His voice. And that is what I want to anchor myself in as I'm going after this. And even my circumstances, like I'm not... I'm working hard, even though it's hard, and even though you're wrestling that out with God and you're being authentic with Him, I'm still anchoring myself in, God, you are true, and I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to trust what you've said. Also, uh, this another thing is Jesus came to give life, and the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, I think it's always important for us in our relationship with God as we're facing struggles and tribulations and hard times is that I do think Sometimes we credit God with things that the enemy's actually doing. And it's like, I think everybody's heart in here, and mine included, is I want to know what God's doing, and I want to know what the enemy's doing. Like, I don't want that to get cloudy. You know, it's like, man, I want to know, like, God, and I think it's important that, that I'm understanding, like, okay, the enemy is here to kill, steal, and destroy. Like, he wants to steal from me. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. Like, this is, this is his scheme. This is his plan. That's what he's trying to do. He's the father of lies. But Jesus is here to give life. And I want to do everything I can to partner my heart, my mind, my soul, everything to partner with what he's doing. And it's so important. You know, I mean, I think sometimes bad things happen, and it's like, man, we'll throw it on God. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if that was God. 
I don't know that that storm was God. I don't know that that disease was God. I, I mean, I don't. To me, if I'm looking at this and I'm looking through the life of Jesus, like He came and He healed. He came and He brought the kingdom, and this is why He came. And so I want to work hard to make sure that I'm partnering with what Jesus is doing. Now, the reality is, is if you're, if you don't run into the enemy every now and then, then you may be heading in the same direction. <laughs> You know, so it's, it's important that like you're going to run into the enemy. We live on a battlefield. We live in a, in a struggle. And so there's going to be hard things, obviously. So <clears throat> I, I'm going to land here. It says, Paul says to rejoice in your affliction or suffering. Like, isn't that just a powerful statement? Like, that, that is, you know, it's like Paul says to rejoice in our suffering, in, in, in the trial because we know that our hope is in God. We know we can trust God, even in the midst of migraines, in the midst of whatever it is that you're, you're facing in your life. Like, even the, the, like, I feel like when I, you know, it's almost like, do I, do I, do I even in my heart like fully understand? It's like you, you want to like fully embrace and understand that I could get to a place where even the struggle, even the tribulation is a place where I can rejoice because I know that God is going to work in the midst of it. See, this is the, the amazing thing about, to me, the goodness of God. Even though maybe He didn't cause it, like God still can work all things out for my good. Even though sometimes maybe even my bad choices and bad decisions, like yes, bad choices and bad things do have consequences, and that even in that, God can turn those things. Like when I yield my heart to Him, like He can actually take something bad and He can use it for my good. And that even in... An affliction. I mean, you read this, and this is awesome because I would say this is so true in my own life, is that, <clears throat> and not only that, but we also rejoice in our affliction because we know that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. This hope does not disappoint because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Like, I know in my own life, <clears throat> some of the hardest moments, some of the places where you probably felt the most broken, where, where you were, felt like the rug got pulled out from under you, felt like you were in a hole, whatever it is, in those moments, man, when I have allowed myself to meet God in that, not avoid it, you know, the, the, the counselors will say spiritual, spiritually bypass it, you know, where we just kind of like try to throw some happy truth at it, but we actually don't invite God into the situation and confront it with Him. But like, man, when I walk through that struggle and that challenge and bring God into that and, and, and sort of like Jacob have a wrestling match with God and confront it and walk through it and allow God to impact me, allow even His goodness and what He's done on the cross and let set my mind, as Paul says, on things above in the midst of it and walk through that, man, there is character gets developed in that. There's something that happens in those broken places that can be so powerful when we allow God to walk, when we allow ourselves to walk through it with God. And so my, my heart for us, sometimes, and, and, and I, a lot of these translations say perseverance, um, sometimes we just have to show up. Like sometimes I think in my own life, if I look at my life and if I had to put a definition on, on perseverance, I would use the language of just showing up. That I, God, I'm going to keep showing up. Even when I'm hurt, even when I'm, I'm walking through a trial, whatever that looks like. If that's showing up in my marriage, if that's showing up to my kids, if that's showing up to church, if that's showing up in community, if that's showing up at the counseling session, if that's showing up at the healing rooms, if it's showing up because we're going to the doctor's office, because we're going to try something else because we want to get healed, if it's showing up and rest because God's asking us to rest and we just feel like right now we're supposed to trust God and what trust looks like is rest, whatever, whatever that looks like to me, like, I'm, I'm just going to show up, and I'm going to do the next thing that God's asking me to do. And I'm going to keep trusting Him, and I'm going to anchor myself in what He says. So if you're able, can you stand? I'm going to have some prayer servants come up and our team come back up. My hope is, is, um, is that encourages us. That in the midst of, because, man, life is going to throw some curveballs. Life throws challenges at us. Um <clears throat> But we can anchor ourselves in who God says that He is. 
and we can trust God and trust His story for our lives. I'm going to have our prayer servants come up as well. And <clears throat> if you need a, a miracle in your body or you need um, just encouragement today, if something in your heart was like, man, I just, I, I, you know, I've been walking through something like that and I just need somebody to partner with me in prayer, our team would love to pray for you. We'd love to encourage you. We'd love to just come alongside you and pray for, for trust and faith in your own life. Again, we're going to do a, a, a healing service next week where we pray for people and, uh, and we're going to believe God for the God of the impossible. We've just seen God do so much in our, our, our church. We've seen, I mean, you, you name it, we've seen marriages restored. We've seen deaf ears or partially deaf ears healed. We've seen people that have had issues being able to even think cognitively because of trauma and God just touching that. And all of a sudden, like God just taking care of that. We've seen hearts changed and lives changed because of Jesus and what He did on that cross for us. And I just want to say this, that if you don't know Jesus, you haven't ever made Him your personal Savior, you haven't just surrendered your heart to Him and made Him the Lord of your life. Like really, that's, it's, a, it's a surrender. And it's also saying, God, I'm going to make you the Lord of my life and I'm going to follow you. And I want to give up my life for the life that you have for me. And the truth is, is that there's no better life. And if, if that is you and, and you want to make that commitment, our, one of our team would love to pray for you this morning. We'd love to, to help you even take next steps of what that looks like in your own life and having a relationship with Jesus and walking with Him. And so we want to make that available as well. well let me just pray for us again. During this song, if you want prayer, you're, uh, we invite you to come up and receive prayer for anything that you need prayer for. God, you're the God of hope. You're the God of hope. You're the God that gives us hope. And God, I just thank you that even in the midst of challenge, God, we can lean into you and, and we can see from your perspective. We can set our minds on things above. And so, Father, I just pray that all throughout this room that there would be a release of hope right now in Jesus' name. God, I, I just pray for that. Even in circumstances and situations, maybe where we, we gave up or we put something down or we, we know that you've even asked us to do something, God, I pray for courage and hope to fill our most inner being, God, that we would be filled with your perspective and what you're doing. And God, I pray that faith would arise inside of us. I, I loved what Pharaoh was sharing earlier, God, that we would, even how you're trying to expand our lives and trying to teach us so that we can see what you have for our lives. God, I just pray for that. I feel like that word is for some people, that God is uh, challenging um, us to more, and that there actually is an invitation to have, a, a, as Farah said, a different spirit, to see something differently, to trust God in a new way. Yep, God, we love you.